Hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel. And today we have got our hands on this extremely special 2019 Range Rover SV Autobiography. Now, to many people, a Range Rover is just a Range Rover. But when you become a nerd with Range Rovers like me and you want to delve into the details a little bit more, you'll notice that there's some subtle and not so subtle differences between the models that you can buy. With the L322 generation, which preceded this, which is the L405, you could have a HSE, a Vogue, a Vogue SE, an Autobiography, a Westminster, and there were some other special editions mixed in there as well. And then with the L405, they ditched the HSE, at least in this market, we got the Vogue as standard. Some people call these the Range Rover Vogue, but actually that's not true. These are just called Range Rover. Vogue is the entry level trim model. Then we had Vogue SE, and then it was autobiography. Now SV in JLR is the special vehicle operations department. A bit like AMG to Mercedes, I suppose. This is your top of the line, extra, 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 lots of customization available option. So what then differentiates this SV autobiography dynamic from the other models in the lineup? Well, first and foremost, this came with the most powerful engine you could have in a Range Rover at the time. Of course, it's the five litre supercharged Jaguar block, but in this one, well, it packs a punch. It almost makes 600 horsepower. It's closer to around 565 and a nice, generous 700 newton meters of torque to go along with that. However, it is propelling two and a half tons of big SUV, but despite that, you can still expect a 0 to 60 time of around the five to five and a half second region. There's some quite obvious styling changes. This grille was exclusive to the SV autobiography. Also, the Range Rover lettering here on the front has got a, I suppose, carbon fibery effect to it. As standard, it came with the top of the range lights, which have the adaptive full beam, and it got a slightly more aggressive front bumper down low. Also, the big wheels that you'll notice on the side on this one, 22 inch. I believe as standard, they were 21. Um, but the whole thing, I mean, it's just, well, it screams excess, doesn't it? Now, if you know me, you know I'm a bit more of a sort of farmer spec Range Rover guy. My heart is with the L322. However, I've only ever had pleasing experiences with l 5s but if I was in the market for one, it would be probably champagne, beige, the smallest wheels possible. Basic spec, be a Vogue, clear glass, no tint, uh, and you name it, all the rest of it, probably a nice cream interior as well. So this isn't really my thing, but I have to say, I mean, it's a proper, I mean, it's a unit, isn't it? Also, if I grab the key, there's things like deployable sidestep, which came with the SV autobiography. I don't believe they were an option on this. And so essentially, these were just the ones that you could get that had all the boxes ticked. And what's absolutely mind boggling is that when this car was new, this would have been near as makes no difference, 200,000 pounds. And you heard me right in saying that this is only a 2019 car. This one on around 60, 65,000 miles could probably be picked up from a dealership for well, less than 50 grand, probably closer to 40 actually in this day and age with everything going on with Range Rover insurance and things like that. And these ones being the particularly nickable ones. It's pretty mad. That's about a quarter of what it was new in just five years. But fortunately, the owner of this, my friend Rob, who's actually been on my YouTube channel before, Rob is the owner of Madder Customs, who if you have been watching for a while, my Jaguar S-Type, I took it to them and they helped me and worked with me to get some suspension done. We looked at the rust and we did a few other bits to that car. So those videos are on my channel. And this is Rob's car and he's very kindly done a swap with me over the past 10 days it's been. He's had my KN and I've had this. I mean, he's had a little bit of a fall from grace there. I still feel extremely lucky. It's not the most fairest of trades. My 5,000 pound KN versus his 50,000 pound SV autobiography. But it has been a wonderful experience having this car for those 10 days. But you'll be pleased to know Rob didn't buy this car. Now, he didn't spend 200 grand for it. He had bought it after most of that depreciation was done. But these things have only been tumbling down further. And so when we jump inside and you see the sort of toys that you get, it's arguable, but these seem like 
resplendent value for money right now. Around the back of the SV autobiography, we also have that carbon fiber effect. Lettering on the tailgate, we've got these big exhausts, which I have to say, I like the way these look. If you go back to the pre-facelift SV autobiography, I think before 2018, this is probably the first facelift model year, it had a quad exhaust setup. And for me, that was a little bit tacky is a bit of a funny word to use from someone coming from a £5,000 KN. But yeah, it looked a little bit on the tackier side. These are much more subtle exit pipes, much more in line with the Range Rover. And, and this is a Range Rover through and through. I mean, like I say, it's basically exactly the same as any other L405. You've got your Hallmark split folding tailgate. It's just everything's a little bit more posh. I mean, take this for example. There's the count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine buttons here in the tailgate, which are electronic. I can fold out the deployable tow bar, which this car has. I can lower the air suspension to make it easier to load my shopping or my dog. I can fold down all of the seats electronically and it is all just quite majestic. But essentially the SV autobiography is every Range Rover fan's wet dream. It's every single classified listing you've looked at online, every single auto trader ad that you've saved to your favorites of Range Rovers all merged into one because it has all the boxes ticked, it has all the toys, and when you step inside, it's got an interior that you can only dream of. So stepping up into the L405 then, and you know that it's something special. The first thing you see actually looking up, of course, is this panoramic roof, but not just that, the leather stitched headliner. I mean, if anything screams excess, that's it for me. And then you glance down and notice the wonderful, opulent, two-tone caramel and black quilted leather seats. And then you realize you're sitting on, and honestly, these things are just a dream. They are so, so unbelievably comfortable. Then you lean back and realize you've got an extremely plush airplane style headrest, which has the wings that you can adjust and lean on like so. I mean, I honestly feel like I'm reviewing, I wouldn't say a business class seat, but certainly a premium economy seat, which is pretty mental to have in the back of your car. But there's quite a few things in here that you wouldn't have in a premium economy seat. First of which is really rude cabin crew, but secondly, heated and cooled seats. So you've got heated and cooled seats front and rear, and also on all seats you have a massage function which can be activated with a button down here but I can also go into my screen click on seats I'm going to have my cooled seat off for now but the combination massage isn't really doing it for me so I'm just going to see if I can choose a different one in fact I think I'll probably go for a hot stone massage the party piece of the back of this car though and the reason i'm sat on this side as opposed to that side is because on my control panel here i can press a button which moves the passenger front seat out of the way moves me all the way back and extends a footrest below me where i can essentially lie back <laughs> and this just feels so wrong to think I'm sat in the back of a car. And I'm actually, funny enough, being quite careful here with my feet because as you can see, well, I'm not fully outstretched. This is not a long wheelbase car. And so it almost doesn't quite work having this in this car. Cause yeah, if I try and stretch forward, I'm gonna mark the back of that seat. I'm trying not to do that, but that's me pushing all the way forward. And my knees are still pretty bent. It's certainly not, a flat bed, so to speak. You press this electronic central divider and uh, it takes a little bit of time, but it will fold all the way down. And in here we can open up to reveal a controller. So they've thought of that. I can switch between the left-hand side and the right-hand side screen. And I can now use this controller to use the screen. And so ultimately entering the best part of any Range Rover. I know the back of it is cool, but this is where we really wanna be, in the driving seat or the command center as I like to deem it. And immediately you're greeted by Special Vehicle Operations SV Autobiography on the dashboard in front of you. I really love the interior of this car. I think the caramel is just beautiful and it's not something that you would see in a normal model necessarily. The quilted leather, again, just beautiful, lovely, lovely, lovely and supple to sit in and then the top here black leather stitching of course we have the leather headliner 
above us here too. Even the sun visors have got a beautiful suede lining on the inside, leather on the outside, and that carries, of course, for both of them because this is a Range Rover and we have two sun visors each. Looking down at some of the other trim pieces, we've got this piano black effect trim down here, which is a bit unusual in these SUV autobiographies because most of them that I've seen tend to have a carbon fiber effect trim, which I'm not necessarily a fan of in a Range Rover, but at least it probably doesn't scratch quite as much as this because this looks really quite bad after, well, only five years. It's very, very scratched up, looks very orange peely. Obviously on the side door panels here, it's not as bad. And on the button controls, we essentially have the same thing, but down here at least it's quite bad. And if we pull back here, reveals a fridge, which is always a lovely thing to have. You've also got a USB input times two, which is what you'll need to plug in your Apple CarPlay. This thing doesn't have wireless Apple CarPlay, which I find kind of crazy uh, because there was a lot of cars around at this time that did. JLR always seem to be a little bit behind with their technological advancements when it comes to their infotainment. Back to what's in front of us quickly though. Well, first and foremost, you have a gorgeous view over that behemoth bonnet, large wing mirrors to the side and lots and lots of glass, which in any Range Rover is one of the best things. It's just glass all around and you can see fantastically. We have this very plain looking steering wheel, which appears to have no buttons on it, but of course the buttons are now digital and they light up within here once we switch on the ignition. A couple of very chunky reassuring indicator stalks and lovely metallic paddles here for the gearbox. These feel absolutely fantastic. This wheel as well, although I'm a sucker for a wooden steering wheel, this has the still got the same effect and this piano black part of the wheel feels, I can't describe, it feels so lovely in your hands and I just drive along holding it because yeah, I don't think there's a nicer feeling material in the world. It makes this leather around the rest of the wheel feel like sandpaper because this is just so smooth and satisfying to hold. But the sun visors aren't the only thing that come in pairs in Range Rover. Of course, we've got a double glove box. We've got a lower glove box, which is large as you would expect, and an upper one too for slightly smaller items. And then let's just switch on the ignition and wake everything up a little bit because then things will start to make a bit more sense. So on the right-hand side, we've got this digital panel here for our wing mirror controls. We can fold our wing mirrors in this way and also our access mode button for the air suspension. Then got our window switches, which gladly are actual real buttons. And below that, the side mounted seating controls. And I think Jaguar Land Rover at the time just did this best of any manufacturer. You can adjust so, so much and genuinely anybody, this is one great thing about Range Rovers in general, is anyone could be comfortable in this car, whether you're big, small, little or large, you're gonna find a seat position that works for you. And of course, once you do that, you can remember it with the memory function of which there are three memory options here. A button here for activating your massage, which you can also configure between in this lower screen, which we'll look at in a moment. And below the dash here, we've got a button for opening up the tailgate and one for adjusting the brightness of the instruments, which is nice again, that we still have an actual analog knob for doing that. And now with the ignition on, we can see that these buttons on my steering wheel have woken up. So on the right hand side, these stay the same at all times. This is your cruise control of which this has adaptive cruise. Then on the left hand side, some more controls, which will change based on what you are doing. So for example, right now I've got the radio setting uh, selected. And so we can change the volume of the radio either by pushing or sort of sliding up and down or just clicking in. It acts like a button except it's just one big piece of plastic or we can skip. But then when we click down in the center, we can go into menu mode and then the buttons light up to display different things. So in this mode, we've just got up, down, left, right arrows um, for going through our display here where we can choose between how we want this display to look, whether we want two dials or one dial. I've got this in this configuration because it gives you the most information. We've got the one big central dial, all of our trip information on the right, and on the left, you can have your media or your sat nav or something like that. But if you don't want that, you can have a more minimalistic design, which is just your map or just your media or the two zone thing where you've got your rev counter and your speedo on the right hand side and something of your choice in the middle. 
And then in the facelift L405, so how the L405 went out, we had the dual screen setup. And the two screens do slightly different things. So the upper one is essentially your main display. This is where you can do pretty much everything with the car. This main page, you can select from navigation, your media, or your phone. And then scrolling across, there's some more pages you can select from, like Apple CarPlay, like valet mode, or your seats. So if you click seats here, it gives you the ability to fold all of them. You can put the car into chauffeur mode from the front. There's also a four x four information page where you can bring up your cameras. You can look at your low traction launch settings, your off-road information, things like that. There's lots of configurability, obviously, when it comes to the off-roading stuff, which we're not gonna look at in too much detail today because I haven't got really any experience of it having just driven this car on the road for the past 10 days. We can adjust our ambient lighting. There's a plethora of colors we can choose from. And this page is actually quite useful. I needed to use it when I was entering one of those National Trust car parks the other day. It's just a page that has your vehicle dimensions on it. We can also change the settings for our deployable side steps. So we can basically switch them off if we want to or stop them coming in and out automatically. It's quite a handy thing, obviously, if you're planning on going off-roading in the car. But I did just want to make an observation on the deployables, actually, that I always thought if I was buying one of these, I would definitely want to get a car with deployables. But for me, I found them uh, unnecessary, I would say, because the car goes so low in access mode that you don't really ever feel like you need the deployable side steps to get up into the car. Yes, it does help, but not essential. And they also make this really sort of unnerving sound when they fold back in automatically, almost like something's being ripped from underneath the car. So I've not been the biggest fan of the deployable side steps. And for me now, if I was buying an L405, or even an L322 actually, it wouldn't be a deal breaker. I would happily go for one that didn't have them. But there is a slight issue, and I don't know if you've picked up on it with this screen. And although I'm doing quite a good job of it now, when you're actually driving along and trying to use it, it becomes apparent that it's pretty unresponsive. Back to the airplane analogy again, how many times have you been on an airplane and you're trying to interact with the infotainment system on the plane and it's just so jolty and laggy that you end up just using the remote well this feels a bit like that it's quite lethargic in its response and you have to sort of double press things regularly it's also not particularly intuitive say if i want to just go from the radio to my bluetooth well yes i can fiddle about with the wheel and do it that way but if the passenger wants to do it you have to first press the media button down here then you have to click source and then you have to select Joel's iPhone or radio or Simpsons or whatever it is. It also took my wife and I ages to work out how to change the radio station. It turns out that you click find here and then there's a nice list, but alternatively you can go to the lower screen, click these two little dashed lines here and scroll through this way. But it's just, I mean, I'm getting on a little bit now. I mean, I'm 27 years old, right? And sometimes, I feel even a little bit like a dinosaur when it comes to the latest technology stuff, but I feel like I should be able to control this a little bit better. And I just, I just don't find it particularly intuitive or easy to get along with. I've had 10 days with the car now and I still basically just, when I'm driving, I just, I just don't look at that. That's why I've changed my display in front of me to, to have what's playing and to have my trip because normally I'd be looking down there for that sort of stuff. But with this car, I just am not getting on with interacting with the screen whilst driving. So it's all in front of me. So yeah, it's just a little bit lethargic and the same can be said for the screen below as well. So to summarize in the front of the Range Rover then, essentially the hard product, fantastic. And what I mean by that is the seat, the wheel, the buttons, the materials used in here, 10 out of 10. The soft product, the technology stuff, it's more like a five. It's a little bit fiddly, it's a bit slow, and it just creates slightly more work for you. So with that then, let's go for a drive, because we do have a whopping great five litre V8 up ahead of me that is screaming to be driven. So let's go and do that now and see how that works with a Range Rover.
and here we are back in my happy place and I start every review in any Range Rover really by saying the same thing in that the seating position in these cars is just spot on. You sit nice and high up above the road which gives you a fantastic view outside and that's accompanied with the big amounts of glass we have in here and all four corners of this car are easy to see out of. It's a great view out the back and the blind spots are fairly menial. Range Rovers also then just have an effortless way of moving along. I'm sure a lot of that is to do with the trick air suspension that we have in this SV autobiography with the slightly ridiculous 22 inch wheels. On roads like this at least, it still just rides like you're on a cloud. It's just majestic. Of course, we have double glazing all around, wonderful sound insulation, and you really just don't get an impression of anything going on in the outside world whilst you're behind the wheel of a Range Rover. I sometimes think Range Rovers should be one of those things that's recommended along with therapy if you're struggling with stress, for example, because whenever you jump into one of these, you instantly just feel relaxed. And when I'm driving a Range Rover, I never particularly feel like I'm in a hurry, even if I am in a hurry. And I just want to glide along under the speed limit. Which brings me on to this specific car then, because all the Range Rovers I've reviewed in the past, if I think back, apart from the L322 with the 4.2 supercharged litre engine, and my L322 with the 4.4 V8, albeit not that powerful, all the Range Rovers I have driven have been of diesel variety and for me diesels have always been the right engine for Range Rovers however this one being a particularly powerful petrol 565 odd horsepower maybe it's a little bit different because I said in the 4.2 litre supercharged L322 that it just felt a bit well unnecessary a bit wasted because you're just driving along in something so comfortable so quiet that you know, you don't need all of that power. So my main concern with this is if this was gonna be exactly the same. So let's find out. Okay, so let's put this Range Rover then into dynamic, a word that really doesn't correlate with the car in any such way. And I'm gonna use the paddles. I'm gonna pop the gearbox into sport. We've got a nice national speed limit coming up. Let's drop down a gear actually, and there's a good bit of noise to this thing. It does sound rather nice. I think it comes after they put OPF on cars, but still, it's got a nice raspy V8 to it. Nothing like the F-Type I drove quite recently. But anyway, third gear, second gear at 40 miles an hour. Let's go up to 60. And we're at 60 already. Oh my goodness, straight away, this is very different to that L322 supercharged car because it's almighty fast. This is the first time I've driven a Range Rover where you truly get kicked into the back of your seat. It reminds me actually of the Audi RS Q8 that I spent a week with last year. It really does pack a punch and you get a great soundtrack along with it when you put your foot down. Let's just go to third gear again. We're at 50 miles an hour. I'm not gonna be able to floor it for very long, but just get an idea of it. And if you go high up enough in the rev range and you upshift, you get some nice little pops, suitably subtle for a Range Rover, but still enough that you can enjoy them. However, I will just get straight into it and say it that now I've popped it back into eighth. I'm gonna put it back into auto stick cruise control on and this is how I want to drive. Arm rest down, thumb on the wheel, bumbling along this lovely country road at 60 miles per hour watching the world go by listening to my podcast. I don't want to be propelling myself up here at 100, 120 miles per hour. I'm sorry, but for me still, even with this SV autobiography, even with this behemoth power plant that is just fantastic I just I'm not going to use it and it comes with another problem too is that you know every now and then I will admit it's good fun you stick it in dynamic you don't even need to do that you pull a few paddles you go through a little underpass you have some passengers you want to show how fast it is to 
and you have a big old grin on your face and you have a good laugh. But 90% of the time, I am just driving like this. Hell, I've been driving three and a half hours today as I'm actually on my way to drop this car back off in Norfolk. And I've done all of that on cruise control, in automatic, wafting along. But the problem with that is that despite the fact 90% of the time I am driving, cruising, 100% of the time I'm paying for that engine in terms of fuel. So my average over the 800 miles or so I've done in this car, uh, it's been mixed driving, mostly this sort of thing cruising along, but I've done some around town stuff and obviously some performance stuff too, but I would say 90% cruising. I've averaged 21.5 miles per gallon. And I just can't justify that when if you went with a diesel, you'd get almost double that actually. You'd average probably 35, but be able to get 40 if you were being sensible. This, even when I've tried to be sensible, I found that it's hard to get anywhere north of about 25 miles per gallon on any sort of meaningful journey. So I might sound like a boring old man or like a broken record if you've watched videos of mine with similar cars to this, but I just, I can't find a way to make it make sense having this big V8 in this car in this country. I suppose it's one thing if you're in the US where fuel is, well, about half it is, it is in the UK, and you can kind of justify it. They don't really do diesels over there either. But in this country where diesel's five pence a litre more, and you're getting almost twice the fuel economy, I just think it's a no-brainer. And the thing is, the 4.4 TDV8 that you can get in this car, it's not a slow car, it's quick. It still has a six and a bit second nought to 60 times, so it's actually not all that slower than this. You still get a nice V8 burble with that diesel car. No, it's not quite the same as this. And no, it won't kick you back in your seat like this one does, but it's about 70, 75% of the way there in terms of performance. And you're not missing out on any of the luxuries either. Obviously, with this SUV autobiography, you do have some extra, extra, extra stuff like the crazy seats in the back, the heated armrest and heated footrest back there. It's ridiculous. You can't necessarily get that in the diesels as readily, but you know, what you buy the Range Rover for is the armrest, the cruising, the effortless driving. And that does bring me on to actually another complaint that I've got. Now, I will admit, when I first got in this car, I was really shocked by this and actually really almost disappointed. However, after about you know 10 days driving this thing on a daily basis, I got used to it a bit more and it's not as much of a problem for me. But essentially, again, it's to do with that engine and the fact that trying to drive this thing smoothly or like you would want to drive a Range Rover can be quite challenging because there's quite a lot of a null zone on the throttle pedal. So here I'm just pulling away slowly trying to accelerate, but it's taken me a good week and a bit to really learn how to synergize with it because if you jab it slightly too much, you pull away and you lurch away. And if you don't push hard enough down on the pedal, you get honked at because the car doesn't move. It just doesn't quite link up with how I want a Range Rover to feel. With the diesel cars, again, it's effortless. It's, you know, a diesel car, if you've ever driven one, you'll know that that torque is everywhere. And with the throttle pedal, you just tease it ever so slightly and you just surge away and you don't really need to adjust your foot on the pedal all the way up to 70 miles an hour. It's just perfect. You feel at one with the car. But in this, it requires a little bit more attention. It requires a bit more effort to drive it well, to drive it smoothly. And in a Range Rover, again, I don't really want to have to make the effort. I just want to waft along. But really, I think this review has turned out to be a little bit of a homage to the L405 as a platform, because really with everything I've said, it's been, well, this car's really good, but actually you can get pretty much the same thing for a third of the price. The main things that matter and make the difference with the Range Rover are the fantastic seats, the armrests, the incredible view out, the lovely seating position, the double glazing, the wafty nature of the drive, and they're all things you would get in an entry-level model. In fact, with an entry-level model with some 18-inch wheels, the ride quality would be even better than this because with these massive alloys, it can actually be slightly, slightly crashy on bumps or potholes or bad road surfaces. So have I enjoyed my time with this L405? Absolutely 
100%. It's a bit of a big tick for me because I'd always wanted to drive one of these five litre supercharged cars. Hell, I thought I might want to buy one. However, it's been really eye-opening and actually made me realize that I'm gonna seek out something more entry-level when I'm back in the market for the Range Rover and certainly something with a diesel engine because that is just what this car is made for. The pairing of that 4.4 litre V8 diesel and the ZF 8-speed gearbox is not one that I've found matched really anywhere else and this 5-litre supercharged engine doesn't quite take the biscuit either. So I hope you've all enjoyed this brutally honest review. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time with this car and I wanna say a massive thank you to Rob again for letting me borrow it for such a long time. It's been really, really wonderful. And if you have enjoyed the video and you'd like to see more brutally honest reviews like this, you can click in the top right hand side of the screen now to view the playlist where all of my brutally honest reviews can be found. Also, if you've not already, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.